there's, I know there's like two kinds of people in this room. I'm going to see which kind is the godly kind, how many of you are here. The first kind of person is the person who never lets their phone get below like 50% charge. Like they are diligent, they're faithful. Are you in the house this morning? Because I need to know. It's eight of y'all. This is the problem with the world. Y'all are my people. I wake up in the morning and my phone is at 100%. And when I get to the car, it's 99% and I put it on the charger. Because I'm like, I'm not going to be that one, like stranded. Because I lost my phone one time, y'all. I had to call the church to then call three other people to get my mother's phone number. Because I was like, what is her number? What is her number? Her number is mom. That's her number. And so... I don't go without my phone. Now, my husband is the other kind of person. See? He he is the person who on a great day, he's running at like 20%. But he pretty much lives in the my phone is about to die season of life. And so it's always 5%. And then he's sending messages and you send it back. And he's like, I didn't get it. And I'm like, I have to call somebody who's with him to be like, tell him to look at his phone. Oh, it's dead. And so I'm like... Yeah, that makes connection and communication really hard. So sometimes like a good wife at night when he's asleep, I go and put it on the charger. That's what marriage is. You know, you just bear your cross. But I I do that for him sometimes because it's for my own benefit so I can reach him the next day. But being this person means that at night I'm very meticulous. I have all my stuff charging, my laptop's charging, my iPad's charging, my cell phone's charging, my watch is charging, like everything, okay? The electricity is happening. And so when I woke up yesterday morning and I pulled out my phone and was starting to text and talk to some people, and I got a low battery notice, I was like, oh, my goodness, my heart almost skipped a beat. (laughs) I wasn't stranded on the road. I was, like, at my house. I could just plug it in. But just the idea. And I was like, how am I at 7%? Because I know I charged my phone last night. And so I had to try to figure that out. So I looked at my phone. I said, maybe it's the phone. My phone is two years old. And y'all know, in technology, I swear, they send demons out into your phone. (laughs) When it turns two, so nothing works. You just can't even dial. The nine don't work. You can't send a text. It's a software upgrade. Every two days, it's a mess. So I was like, I know what it is. They're trying to get me a new phone. I'm going to have this phone until the wheels fall off. So, like, y'all can keep trying. So I said, maybe it's the phone. It's not the phone. So then I'm looking at the connections, and I'm like, well, okay, the cord looks okay. The wall adapter. Look at the outlet. I know the outlet is working because other stuff is plugged into it. But what happened was I followed it all the way from the phone to the cord to the wall adapter to the wall outlet. And have you ever had the plug in like 90%? And it's just that one little, I mean, it just needed that one last shove. And I don't know why that kept my phone from charging, but it did. And I'm looking at the phone going, nothing's wrong with the phone, nothing's wrong with the cord, nothing's wrong with the adapter, nothing was wrong with the outlet, but it wasn't charging. So it was connected, but not all the way. And when I'm looking at my phone thinking about this, I didn't realize it hadn't charged until I needed my phone. And then when I was ready to put it into use, I started to realize I didn't have what I needed to use the phone. And what I'm, what I'm going to talk about today is very much an idea of charging and connection. And it is the power, the actually understated, under, misunderstood power of prayer. And we miss it all the time because sometimes we look like we're connected, but we're not charging. And so then when life is coming at us, we think we're going to do something external, something visible, something public that's going to give us the charge that we need. But what we really need is closer connection. The power of prayer in the life of the believer is one of the most understated tools that we have. We have direct access to a divine creator, a sovereign God who wants to partner with us to do good things in the earth. Can you imagine? It's like, it's like having a direct line to the president. Now, you might not like this president. This is not about politics. But if you had a direct line to the office, knowing that whenever you call or text it, you could say, why are eggs too high? Why is gas high? <laughs> Fix my taxes. What, you could send anything. I bet you would not waste your time talking to people and complaining and trying to find it online when you had direct access. And everybody loves to go to the White House, right? Even if you don't like the current president. If you win the championship or you do something notable, you're waiting on your invitation to the White House. And if you don't get it, then it's a whole situation that you got snubbed by the White House because you didn't get invited. But here's the thing. We have at our disposal access to a God more powerful than any president. And he doesn't just allow us to visit when we've done something good. 
He says, you don't have to win. You don't have to accomplish. You can come to me anytime. You don't have to dress up. There's no occasion. Anytime you want, you can come and talk to me. There is a power that we are watching go to the wayside because we are more concerned about the outward and visible things than we are about the hidden and inner things. And we are in a culture that loves showmanship. We love, every, if it's not postable, why are we even doing it? And let me tell you, your prayer life is not going to be Instagrammable. It's not going to be a TikTok out of your prayer life. It's going to be a boring one. Like no one wants to see that, but that is how heaven is brought to earth. And so what I want to remind us of today is that there is danger in dead prayer. <laughs> when we have power at our disposal and the things that God is calling us to do will require that we understand the power of that prayer. If you talk to God as often as you talk to your spouse or your friend, what would your relationship be like? Vice versa. If I talk to my friend as only as I talk often as I talk to God, what would our relationship be like? Because there are ways that we connect when we want to. Yeah. But do we understand the power of that connection? In Scripture, we see this over and over again, that we don't get to call down this immediate response from God without intimacy with God. We just want God to act, but we don't want to have to take the time to invest in the relationship. The first mention of prayer in the Scripture is in Genesis 20, and God is telling Abimelech that he needs to ask Abraham to pray for him. You know why? He says, if you ask the prophet to pray for him, you will live and not die. The first mention of prayer is a matter of life and death. And God is saying there is power when you come before the throne of God. It is a matter of life and death. Throughout the rest of Scripture, we see that there's power we miss out on when we don't understand the tool of prayer. We miss the power to bless our enemies. Y'all not excited about that one, I know. But the first mention of prayer in the New Testament is Jesus saying, pray for your enemies. Bless those who persecute you. And y'all are like, yeah, what's next? I know. But God is saying there's so much power in that. More power than revenge. More power than getting even. More power than everybody understanding that you were the one that was right. You can call down heaven. And would you rather them have a soul that is now saved and headed to eternity or them be someone that apologizes to you? He's like, do you need to get even or do you are you concerned about their eternity? That's what he's saying. Your enemy is only going to be your enemy on earth. In heaven, everything is going to be dissolved. So while they're here, is that a big enough deal that you can't pray for them? We see that there's the power of inner restoration because Jesus himself went away often to a lonely place is what our scriptures tell us in the Gospels. There's the power of outer restoration. James 5 says, if you're sick, Call the elders of the church. Let them pray over you, anoint you with oil in the name of the Lord, and the, pr the prayer of faith will save the one who's sick. The Lord will raise him. And it's not a guarantee that the Lord will heal him, but the Lord will raise him. So that means even if you still are not yet healed, you can be strengthened in your weakness, that God can give you the power to endure even if he doesn't restore you fully. That's called sufficient grace, and Paul can tell you about that. We have the power of resistance. We watch and pray that we don't enter into temptation. We have the power to bring life in barren places. Luke chapter 9, they had no child because Elizabeth was barren. Both were advanced in years. And it says the whole church, the whole multitude of people were praying outside of their house at the hour of incense. The reason they were praying is because Luke, because Zacharias and Elizabeth were transparent enough to be able to tell the church and those close to them that they needed prayer because they wanted Elizabeth to conceive in her womb. That means that we don't just give generic prayers like, will you pray for me? Oh, what am I praying for? Wisdom. Okay, and what else? Just decisions about what? Well, you know, just what God is leading me. Where? I mean, just in general. When? You know, just in my life. Because we don't want to tell our business. So we don't want to tell our business. We want to keep everything like it's a great image and not be transparent. But I want you to pray heaven-moving prayers on my behalf. I'm going to pray generic. I'm like, God, give us some generic wisdom. I don't know what she's talking about. So whatever it is, I hope it works out. But when I'm transparent, when I understand that I can let you in to what I need and you can beseech heaven, then the angel comes to Zacharias and said, listen, don't be afraid. Your prayers have been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear a son. Because prayer can bring life into barren places. We have the power of persistence. Luke 18 says he tells them away the idea of the persistent widow. She persisted and then the Lord showed up. So we pray so that we do not lose heart. 
the power of endurance. We have the power of peace over anxiety. That's why Paul tells us in Philippians 4, don't be anxious for anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make your request known to God. We have the power to call down God's abundant ability. We love Ephesians 3 because I know we love now unto him who's able. Mm-hmm. We love it. But let me tell you this, that calling down of God's abundant ability was not for our bank accounts and our agendas and our advancement. It's because Paul had just given the church at Ephesus what seemed like an impossible task. He had just told them in chapter 2, you're dead in your sins and trespasses. You were children of wrath. And then God, being rich in mercy, has made you alive in Christ Jesus. You're not saved by works but by grace. It's a gift. And then in chapter 3, he says, I'm calling you to this high calling of holiness. It's going to be a mystery to the world that you are representing Christ with love and forgiveness and grace. And he knows they are feeling overwhelmed by the mission at hand. And so to assure them, he says... I know this sounds unreasonable. I know it's countercultural. No one will understand, but let me pray for you. Now unto him who's able to do exceedingly and abundantly beyond what you're asking or thinking. And he says, I know you're not just asking for things. I know you're not just asking for a better life. I know what you're asking for is the supernatural ability of God to live the way he wants you to. We call down the abundant ability of God when we have a life of prayer. And lastly, and most importantly, prayer gives us the ability to change things. Theologians call it, call it causality, that we can cause something when we pray. James 4 says you don't have because you don't ask. He said if you would inquire of me, you might be surprised what I do. Just because I want you to partner with me and invite you into your place of need. We can engage with the creator. That he doesn't say there's a qualification. You have to come looking a certain way with a certain amount of expertise. You can engage with me. Y'all and our children and our young adults, everybody needs to know this. Because we can't be thinking that there's only a special group of people that can pray to God. I don't know how y'all grew up, but for a while as a young child, I was in a church and like it was only like the same five or six people that could pray for the church. And it's because they were loud and they were like, Heavenly Father, God, righteous in your name. I mean, it was like a lot of words. And if you could pray a lot without breathing, it was really gifted. Like it was just like a string of words. And Father God, in the matchless mighty name of Jesus, we call you. I mean, it was like, brr, I don't even know what they said, but it was loud and it was good. And ever, it was rich. And everybody's like, oh, yeah, that's the prayer warriors. They calling down heaven. Y'all, let me tell you something. I can say this now because that church is not there anymore, but <laughs> I'm not going to say the name of church because, listen, in the name of Jesus, we had a pastor. I was young. I had to be like five or six before I found my permanent church home. <laughs> this, this pastor would get up every Sunday, y'all, and at the end of his sermon, he would get down on one knee and pray. And I am not kidding you. A trustee brought out a cape and put it on it. I'm talking full James Brown. He was... <laughs> on his knees praying and he would say our God who art in heaven our bridge over troubled water I knew most of the prayer I still remember most of it because I know when he got loud all the kids in the choir we would say in ages past you have been faithful I mean like we knew the prayer because he was praying the same thing all the time so you grow up with different experiences of prayer and God is saying let me just debunk this myth let me explain to you that you have a power that's not about a prescription. It's not about a personality. It's not about a presentation. It's, it's sometimes in the unseen places. And let, I need you to know that the enemy knows the power that you have. So that's why he's not concerned about how long your skirt is or if you're coming to church or if you're talking a little bit better or not going to the places. Oh, that's nice. You can even read your Bible, but don't pray. You can serve more, but don't pray. You can show up more, but don't pray. Be in a life group, but don't pray. Give to the poor, but make sure you don't pray. Because the power comes in engaging the divine, engaging the creator to bring change. And right when you want to do it, right when you say, I'm about to change my prayer life, God, you know what's going to happen? He's going to, the enemy is going to whisper intimidation. You don't know what to say. You, this is not your thing. Just let somebody else do this. Let me tell you a thing about the Bible. There's a whole list of spiritual gifts across various scriptures. Not one of them is prayer. 
That is not anybody's spiritual gift. Prayer is the spiritual calling of every believer. No one is more gifted than the other at prayer. And the enemy is going to whisper intimidation because he doesn't want you to have that power. He's going to whisper shame and say, you remember how you acted this week? You don't need to pray. God is not going to hear you. If he doesn't do that, he's going to show you distractions. you thinking about your grocery list. You got bored. My mind is wandering. I must not be spiritual. Let me tell you something. Everything is not going to seem like dark, demonic activity. If, if the enemy can get you thinking about your grocery list, you're still not praying. He does not want you to engage heaven. The Bible says his goal is to devour and to destroy. And if he cannot do that, he will disable. He will allow you to walk away from the power that you have. And you'll know all your scriptures and read through your plan and start coming to church on time and start serving and doing all these things with no prayer life. So your charge, your connection stays the same. And you're like, why am I so busy? Why am I doing the activities of the Lord, but I don't see the power of God in my life? He said, because the power of God does not come from your activity. It doesn't come from your morality. It comes from your prayer life. The enemy knows it, do you? We got weighty things we're dealing with in this culture. Anxiety and depression. Our kids are struggling. Our kids need to know they can pray to God. You don't have to be 32 with a testimony to get up and pray. They need to know that between classes and at school and when they're unsure, and even if they're already in the place they shouldn't be, they can call out to God. When my son starts to get worried about stuff and he's only 10, but I'm telling you the way anxiety is attacking kids this day, I'm like, I don't understand. But he has nights he can't sleep or he's worried. And before I pray for him, I always make him pray for himself. Hey, I don't want you to think that only mama can pray for you. I need you to know that if your words are imperfect and you're not sure, God listens and he hears you. So we've got to equip ourselves and those that we influence with the power of prayer. The second mention of prayer is where we'll be for a few minutes today. And in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says this. <clears throat> and when you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues on the street corners so they'll be seen by people. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. <clears throat> Excuse me. But as for you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, pray to your father who is in secret, and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you're praying, do not use thoughtless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask. And then he goes on to say, pray in this way. He's not saying pray this exact prayer. He's saying pray in this way. Our Father, who's in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now before he gets into the Lord's Prayer, <clears throat> excuse me. Before he even gets into the Lord prayer, Lord's Prayer, he tells us what not to do. He said, don't be like the hypocrites because they are extra and it's not effective. He's saying, when you pray, by the way, not if you pray, because Jesus is saying, how can you be a follower of me and not be in constant prayer? Prayer is like the air that we need. He's like, I know that you're going to pray. I know you're not going to wait till crisis. So when you pray, I know that you're going to do it and you're going to be consistent and fervent. That, that word means earnest or genuine. And it covers every kind of prayer, adoration, confession, worship, supplication, intercession. All of those things are encompassed in this particular word of prayer. And he said, but there's a way to do it. I don't want you to be extra and dramatic. He's undoing the way they saw prayer. Because they might not have grown up at my church, but they grew up as Orthodox Jews. And so they understood that at 9 and noon and 3 were the call times of prayer. And wherever you were, you stopped what you were doing. Even if you were on the street corner, which is why he says that. And it was visible. So it was a big thing. So everybody knew that you were praying. He said, but though they're hypocrites when their heart is not right. These are the hypocrites that he says make a spectacle of their generosity in Matthew 6. Or they look sad and haggard when they're fasting. You know, it's a drama. You got to tell people, you know, I'm fasting. I'm giving up things. <laughs> no, no, no. You go ahead and eat your chips. You know, I'm spiritual. <laughs> you know, we find ways to do it. Well, no, I'm just right now the Lord has me in a seat. Okay. All right. He's like, just keep it to yourself. It's okay because once you make it public, he's saying you're getting your reward. 
They love to stand in the synagogues and on the street corners. And he says, you know, they can be the loudest and they can have the best voices. They can be great orators and great with words, but that doesn't mean there's power in their prayer. He's saying, run away from the showmanship. Why? Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. That word reward means an earned wage. He's saying what they're earning is the applause from the people who are impressed with what they're performing. They, they have their reward. But when you go into the secret place, in the inner room, you pray, and then the Father will see you, and he says he'll reward you. That word reward actually means something different. It's a gift. It's a promise. It's not something earned. It's just that he's saying you actually engage with God. He's going to do something that you could not do on your own behalf. So this is not just an applause because you did a good job. This is your father. The psalm says he inclined his ear to me when I, when I reached out to the Lord. That he listens to us. That he wants to commune with us. The question is, do you want applause or do you want an answer? Do you want people to say, man, he can call down heaven. But heaven ain't really here because we didn't call down heaven. We had some great words, but they hit the ceiling. The people calling down heaven are probably the people you don't see. They're the ones interceding for you and you don't even know about it. When I get a text from my friend that I haven't talked to in several weeks or several months and they say, you were on my mind, I'm just praying for you. That's the prayer I want. I don't need to know the words they prayed. Whatever God said, yeah, do that. Yeah, because when my grandmother and my mother got me through college (laughs) and most of my life and I was wondering how did that work out and I'd be like, oh, my grandmother, that's what it was. My mother, somebody prayed for me. Because I don't know how I got out of that situation or how I did well in that particular area. That's because someone was interceding for you and you didn't even know about it. It's like when you get on a plane, if you've ever been on a plane, the, the plane, the airplane bathroom is about that big. And it's just enough to get in there and try to turn around and, and handle your business. And it is, it's tough. But one thing that's interesting about that airplane bathroom is that the light doesn't come on until you close the door all the way. So it's dark and you're trying to fumble your way in there. You got to close the door and lock it and then the light comes on. That's just like our prayer life. God is saying, if you're trying to let everybody see, then don't look for my light. They're going to give you what you want. Get in there, close the door in the secret place. Romans 8 says that when we don't have words, the Spirit himself intercedes for us with moanings and groanings. Listen, it's going to be awkward to be on the stage or interceding or in front of people waiting on the Spirit to intercede. That's going to be an awkward silence. Nobody's going to want to do that. They want it to be quick. That's why we pack the house for concerts and seven people come to prayer meeting because we want everything to happen instantly. He says, you need to give the spirit room to move. And that might not be in front of a lot of people. It might be in a quiet place. Jesus says, reject the showmanship. Receive the secret place. That's where change is happening. That's where heaven is called down. And he says, when you do it, I want you to pray in this way. And there's six simple categories that I want to talk about with the Lord's Prayer for just our next few moments together. The first two words of this prayer set the entire tone, our Father. Everything is about the fact that we are his children. That's why this prayer is not for the unbeliever. Now, there may be unbelievers in the house. You may be still figuring out God or you know what it was like when you prayed before you came to the Lord. He'll hear you. He'll listen because he's good and he's gracious. But this prayer is for those who say he's my father. This is not the man upstairs, the one up there, the guy you know, the big guy in the sky. No, this is my father. That means I'm subjected to him. I'm submitted to him. That means I'm his possession. I'm his child. I belong to him. This is family. Because he didn't say our sovereign Lord, our powerful Lord, our omniscient Lord, our omnipresent. A lot of things he could have called God, but he said, this is your father. Romans 8 says, you've received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our gift that we are the children of God. This is belonging. This is God already speaking into every crack and crevice that your earthly father may have left. He says, I got you. That they're not the standard. I'm the standard. Wherever they failed you, I got you. If they abandoned you, I'm present. If they rejected you, I approve. They didn't know how to love you, mine is perfect. They only loved you when you did well, mine is unconditional. Father, he's our father. And that close association is the foundation of our prayer life. He's not our dispenser. He's not just our protector. He's not just our, the one that does stuff. He's father. When I'm home, y'all, it don't take but two seconds for me to hear my son. Ma, 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 ma. It is, I don't even have time to answer. 
between the moms, and they get louder. And I'm telling you, I will go up there, and I'll say, son, what is it? Who is bleeding? What, what happened? <laughs> oh, um, are we still going to the zoo Friday? <laughs> that was the 911 call, like, all the time. If he's doing some, mom, 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 did you see that? I, I have to show up to the soccer games on time because if I come in the middle of the game, he's in the game. He's like, hey, ma, son, I need you to focus on the game. You know, he running to the sideline. Ma, we're going to lunch. I need you to be in this game, son. That's my boy. You know, mamas and sons, it's a thing, you know. I don't know if y'all saw this. There was an NFL clip. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about it, but there was an NFL clip, y'all, of a player who was like, where's my mama? I need my mama. Where is my mama? I mean, it was hilarious. And I was like, I get that. I do. I do. Now, my daughter, she's like, I'm good. I saw you yesterday. Why, why are we still talking? <laughs> but my son is like, Ma, 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 Ma. He wants that constant connection. He wants my approval. He wants my input. He wants my say so. He wants to explain to me Pokemon and Minecraft things I have no concept of, but he wants me to nod along and be a part of it because guess what? He's mine. And when, when we're a child of the Father, we want to just be with him. We want his presence. We want, he don't have to say anything. He just wants me to sit there. So when we come to him saying, our Father, we're saying, God, I'm yours. This is a, this is a dependence on you, first and foremost. And that Father connection is important because Jesus told the Pharisees in John 8, he said, you are of your Father, the devil. So everybody that go to church don't have the same Father. Everybody that knows the scriptures don't have the same father. He said, if, if Abraham was your father, even you would have recognized me. But you don't know me because we don't have the same father. So, so you can pray all you want, but it's not going to my father. He said, that's a big deal. Like this, this children, this, the fact that we are children dependent on our father in relationship with him. Secondly, we see devotion to the father. First, dependence on the father, now devotion to the father. Hollywood be your name. Now, I grew up with Hollywood. The newer versions say something like holy. Hollywood just feels spiritual, don't it? Like Hollywood. I didn't even know what it was. I was like, Halloween, be your name. I was a kid. But it really means to make your name holy. That actually is a request. It's not just a declaration. It's saying, holy be your name, God. Like before I ask for anything, the first request in the Lord's prayer is that the holiness of God's name be priority. Now, that's a game changer because that's not just lip service. And now you're saying anything that I ask for after this must align with your holiness. Whatever I'm about to ask for, God, must be something that's going to make your name great, something that prioritizes your glory. Because we come to God usually with our agendas. Here's the things we need to pray for. Let me tack a salutation at the top. Our Father, you're good. And something at the bottom, your will be done. But really, not your will, my will, Lord. Can you just do what I asked and bless it? And God is saying, wait, before you even get to your personal request, is your goal to make my name great? Because you might be ready to pray for healing, and as you start to think about what makes God's name great and his spirit speaks to you, he will tell you that instead of this time on healing, I'm going to just sustain you. Instead of this time promoting you, I'm just going to provide right where you are. Instead of making everything work out, I, I know you want your marriage to be on a 10, but right now we're going to struggle for a little bit because I want your faith to be tested. Amen. See, only the Spirit is going to tell you that because otherwise you'll skip through all that and get to your prayer, and then you will be wondering, I've been praying this same prayer over and over again, why is God not answering? And God is saying, you're asking what I didn't ask what you to ask in the first place. What you're asking for wasn't led by my holiness because sometimes he is going to heal, and sometimes he gives us a standing grace. But we can say, in my weakness, his power is made perfect. That he, his grace is sufficient. Sometimes in our brokenheartedness, before he heals it, he just revives us. That we can still live life while we're healing. That we can still have joy while we're in pain. That we can still have fullness and peace even in the midst of deep grief. God says, I can do it all. But are you most concerned about my name? Because what my name needs sometimes is not going to feel good to you but it's going to glorify me. Do I really see my first priority as glorifying God? The third, commitment to the Father's mission. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, I need you to understand where your will be done is coming in this prayer. This is not all the stuff I want if it's your will, Lord. Because really, we're like, please let it be your will. <laughs> I mean, we're just saying that like... <laughs> For formality, but Lord, really, for real, can you just do everything I ask? And then I'm going to bless you for it, I promise. 
Jesus is saying, no, before you get to what you're asking for, Father, dependence, devotion to the holiness of his name, commitment to his mission. God, if what I'm asking you works against how you want to expand your kingdom through me, say no. Who's praying that? No, in our minds, in our journal. <laughs> oh, that was a good note from the message. Not doing that, but Lord, <laughs> can you please just bless me anyhow? Because that's what we want. He says, but I want you to seek first my kingdom, and then the things will be added. Don't seek my kingdom at the closeout, thinking that what you want already lines up with what I wanted. Ask me first. Because in all this time, as we're opening up and expressing our dependence on God, our devotion to God, our commitment to his mission, the spirit is starting to penetrate our hearts. See, when you run into prayer with just the things you need, you're right in the flesh. You know what you want. You know what you need. You know why you're upset. You know what your goal is. You don't give the spirit any room to begin to, to push that flesh down so you can really connect with God. But when we start to honor God and worship him and, and remind, us, remind ourselves of how dependent we are on him, renew our commitment to his mission, then the spirit is like, yes, this is my kind of talk. And then you'll find yourself asking for different stuff than what you went in about. Because the spirit will redirect you and he'll give you guidance. And he'll say, girl, save your breath. He's not doing that. Don't even ask that, son, bro, no, no, he's not doing that. Now, this is what you should say. That's, that's what will happen. Like I tell my kids sometimes, my son comes in and he's talking about he's starving and hungry. And I say, what do you want? And so now we used to go through this whole list because when he was hungry, all of a sudden he wanted candy. So I was like, that's not hunger, son. I'm trying to explain to him. You may have a craving, that's not hunger. So I used to say, here's what you can have. You can have fruit, you can have yogurt, you know, something healthy. We're trying to break cycles in here, right? So <laughs> now he comes to me and he's like, mom, I'm hungry. And I say to him, what can you have? And he tells me, I can have fruit, I can have, that's right. You know what? You connected with me long enough to know that I had to reorient his request. Because what he asked for on his own was junk and unhealthy. And it wasn't going to satisfy his hunger anyway. After he talked to me long enough, now I don't have to tell him anymore. Because he knows what he can ask for. And that's what God does. When we connect with him consistently, he says, I'm going to tell you what to ask for. And then you'll be like, oh my gosh, God did what I asked for. He said, because I told you what to ask for. I'm setting you up for success. Listen to me, I'll give you guidance, and then my yes will come so quickly you won't even know what hit you. Because what I tell you to ask me up for, I'm ready to do anyway. That is what it means to connect with God. It's a commitment to the Father's mission. Number four, provision from the Father. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, y'all, this is bigger than just provision for the rest of 23 and 24 and your five-year plan. Daily bread. That's a manna mentality. That's what I call it. That is when you are in the wilderness waiting on God to provide each day. And I know nobody is like praying for their paycheck today. You're like, no, I really want my, my monthly, my every two weeks, <laughs> forever. <laughs> and God is not saying you can't plan for the future. That's not the goal. But he's saying there is a daily dependence that when I really think about what I need right now, I can depend on God in a different way. That's why in the wilderness, he didn't let the children of Israel collect two days' worth of manna. He said, if you collect two days' worth, I'm going to make it spoil. You need today. I will provide for you each day. And sometimes we get so comfortable when God gives us all this long-term provision that we forget that we're still dependent on him daily. How many times have we made a move and something didn't work out because we thought it was locked up? How many times have we made a purchase or made a decision by something that we thought was going to come to pass and it never came to pass? And God is like, I'm not trying to be your God of tomorrow. I, just, I want to start with today. What do you need from God today? When I ask God for daily bread, it's not just provision. It's also how he wants to use me. Is there going to be a divine conversation that comes my way? Who do I need to be praying for? Maybe there's someone whose child is sick. Maybe there's a friend I need to reach out to. Just today is enough. A man of mentality that says, God, you are so, you are such a guaranteed provider. I don't need a storehouse of stuff. I know you got me. Every day that you open my eyes, you have already provided for that day. That's why he says tomorrow has enough trouble of its own. Why are you anxious? Seek first the kingdom of God. He's like, I've got you every single day. We ask for God's provision and we ask for his provision on behalf of others. That'll, that'll be enough to keep you busy. 
Just asking what do people need today. Go through your text messages. Go through the last conversations you had this week. He will start to bring people to your mind. Pray for this. Pray for this. Cover that. There's nothing like getting that message from a friend or from someone that maybe you don't even know well or haven't talked to in a while. And they say, today, God put you on my heart. Today. Nobody says, God put you on my heart next Christmas. I just want to give you a heads up. No, they say, today. That's what happens. God puts someone on our hearts that day, and then we're able to say, you didn't ask for this, but today I lifted your name up. I covered you. It may explain how you get through some of these days because there's people going before you asking for daily bread that you didn't even know about. This is our commitment, our provision that we need from the Father. Number five, love for the Father's family. Now, all of these things, the Our Father, hallowed be your name. Kingdom come, your will be done. All of these things. Give us this day our daily bread. All of this culminates to relationship. Y'all say relationship. I know. We want to sit in our corner, sit with our Bibles, take our notes, love God, and go on about our business. But there's a reason why he says forgive us our debts as we've also forgiven our debtors. Because he's not just talking about forgiveness. He's talking about relationship. He's saying you cannot have vertical relationship with me only and it never show up horizontally. You can't just be like so full of worship and so in love with me and then holding grudges and being easily offended and not mending relationships. If you're going to pray in a way that brings power in your life, you have to consider those you're in relationship with. Confession has to be a part of your prayer life. You have to be able to say, God, here's where I failed you. And I'm talking about explain this. You need to confess in detail. One of the most freeing things that I have experienced in the last several years is intentional confession. Because we love a blanket confession. Now, our requests are real specific. Could you do this on this day? And can he be wearing green? Like, we just know exactly how we want it to go. When I walk into the meeting, can you make him say this? And I'll know it's you, Lord. Like, we got all these specifics. But when it comes to our sin, oh, forgive me, Lord. All right, next. No, confess. He'll tell you. You said this today, or you ignored this today, or this was in your heart. You were jealous today. Today you were gossiping. Today you were angry for no reason. Like, he will start to explain to you where we've fallen short. And that's not for shame. That's for awareness. Because when God starts to detail how I have disappointed him, instantly I begin to think of those that I need to seek forgiveness from. He's saying these things are tied together. As I show you how much forgiveness I give you, that's supposed to spur you on to forgive others. You should not be comfortable receiving all the grace, all the pardons, all the second chances from me and giving out none. He said that, that's going to that's take the power out of your prayer life. It's going to take the power out of your prayer life because that means you don't really want my kingdom to come. You don't really want my will to be done. You don't really depend on me. You don't really want to worship me because you are able to be a hoarder of my blessings. And you actually think there's people that you don't have to pass it on to. When the scripture says that as you forgive, the Father will forgive. He says, I'm going to tie the two together because I don't think you'd act right if it wasn't a consequence. Like you need to ask God and he will show you people. That's why the scripture says, don't bring your sacrifice to the altar if you think someone has an issue with you. Leave it and go reconcile. Unforgiveness and grudges and unhealed pain and all that stuff, it kills the power in our prayer life, y'all. It kills the power in our prayer life. So he says you got to deal with that. That's love for the father's family. And lastly, number six, protection from the father. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, the Lord doesn't lead us into temptation. The scripture says he'll never lead us into temptation, but he leads us into a test. And when our flesh don't act right, we take the test and it becomes a temptation. Because we want to feel good or we want to get out quickly or we want to find some way to get through it that's not honoring to the Lord. So this cry here is what Jesus says in Luke 21, 36. Keep on the alert at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all the things that are about to take place and stand before the Son of Man. He says you need to pray that you're not led by your flesh into tempting situations that really should have just been testing situations. So that we can say genuinely, like James says in James 1, count it joy. 1 Corinthians 10 says that God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he provides a way of escape. But our flesh, we see the exit sign, but we're like, "Mm, I'm going to circle back around. This feels good right here. 
So we're praying literally for deliverance from evil. And evil might not look like you think it's going to look. We are in a society where evil is starting to disguise itself as good. There is spiritual darkness raising up in this culture. And then we got priestesses and gurus and everybody talking about they got the light. And they're not talking about Jesus. Everybody wants to call you into some kind of spiritual engagement, some kind of spiritual connection. You got to pray for discernment. Lord, help me not to fall into temptation. Because at the right moment, when you think God is not listening or when life is not working out, you're going to get that message. You're going to get that ad. Or you're going to get somebody saying, oh, just do this. Just light this. Just clang these together. Just lay these crystals out. And you're like, you know what? Maybe that's going to help because God is not listening. That's a lie of the enemy. Lord, help me not to be tempted by all the spiritual alternatives of this world. Remind me that there is only one true and living God. Then we conclude, in the name of the Father, Son. This is not in the Lord's Prayer, but this is what we see in John 14, where Jesus says, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do. Now, he can say this because he's already told them how to pray. He's not telling this to people who don't understand the importance of worship and prioritizing God and his kingdom and his will. He's not saying, just write me a wish list and then put my name on it. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, you ask it of me for my father's will, my father's kingdom, the holiness, the hollowedness of my father's name. Then I'm going to do it because it's in line with what my father wants. And lastly, we pray in the power of the father's spirit. James 4, 2 says, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly and you spend it on your passions. He said, you can pray a good prayer, but if it's not in the power of the Spirit, it's wasted words. Jude 1, 18, Jude is such a great book, it's a short book, and he's talking about false teachers, and he says this, they said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. Hello? It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit, But you, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God. This is the constant, desperate need of the Spirit's direction. I cannot tell you how many moments, and I'm a natural talker, I'm usually not short for words, but I can't tell you how many moments that when I choose to yield to the Spirit and I'm praying with someone, and then sometimes it's awkward and it's quiet and it's silent, but if you say, God, I'm not speaking until you speak, You might say fewer words, and it might not be polished, but it's going to be powerful. Like, that's how we pray down heaven, because we're allowing the Spirit to speak first. I was with a woman not long ago who was experiencing deep tragedy because her young daughter had died in a car accident, and I didn't know what to say. And I didn't want to say, he'll supply all your needs according to his riches in Christ, and he'll work it out for his good for those who I didn't want to give another prayer, another scripture that she's heard before. I wanted a man of word. I wanted something fresh. So we sat there, y'all, and it was awkward. We sat there holding hands right up here at the front, looking at each other. And then we closed our eyes, and it was probably like two or three minutes. Now, in prayer time, that felt like about five days. I'm sure people (laughs) were walking by like, what are they doing? We just sitting up there quiet. I was like, Lord, I'm not saying it to you. Tell me what to say. And then he started reminding me to encourage her with the hope of heaven. We talked about eternity. We talked about the fact that she's going to have more time with her daughter in heaven than she had on earth. We talked about the fact that her calling was bigger than parenting, that God still had something for her. And in that moment when she was ready to leave church, she didn't want to be here because everything reminded her of her daughter. When we finished praying that prayer, she said, oh, the Lord just told me I need to have a ministry to parents who've lost children. That's what prayer does, y'all. That's what prayer does. It don't matter how much scripture you know, if you're not invoking the power of the Holy Spirit, thank you, my dear, then you will just have a bunch of flesh, spiritual sound, and prayer. But no change. You'll look connected, but you won't be charging. So we pray with the dependence on the Father, devotion to the Father, commitment to the Father's mission, provision from the Father, love for the Father's family, protection from the Father, in the name of the Father's Son, and in the power of the Father's Spirit. Can I just encourage you, church, that prayer is something that has to be practiced. I don't want you to think you're going to leave here and there's going to be some spiritual infusion, and all of a sudden it's going to feel good and be easy. 
The enemy wants you to be discouraged. He wants you to be distracted. But, you know, when we're ready to get, get our weight together and go in the gym, we stand in there, we look in awkward, we don't know which machines to use and how to use it, and we just we keep going every day because we're committed to the change when it's important to us. And then sometimes we watch other people and we do their workouts because we're like, oh, okay, let me see if I can try that. When we're trying to eat healthy and you don't love eating healthy, broccoli is not going to taste good to you on day one. It's not. But eventually you're going to learn how to saute it or mix it up with something else because you're committed to the change. We know how to commit. I don't want you to be more committed to something physical that's temporary than you are to your prayer life. The change is going to happen when no one is looking. So I want to encourage us that we, as Jesus said, we can be a house of prayer. There's nothing wrong with worship. I love it. I love it. I love ministry. I love serving. But without prayer, there's no power. There's no power. So decide today what you're going to do practically. How will you make time for God? Five minutes, ten minutes, let it grow every day. Write down those distractions. Get it out of your mind. See the enemy coming. He don't want you to set time aside. Somebody's going to call. Emergency is going to come up. You're going to get distracted. You're going to be sleepy. You're going to run out of words. It's going to feel boring. I'm telling you, the enemy is not dumb. He knows how to keep you powerless. But today, in the name of Jesus, we are shutting down dead prayer. In the name of Jesus, we are committing to be a house of prayer, a people of prayer who don't need public applause, but commit to the private, powerful life of a son or daughter who prays in the name of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we are privileged that you would partner with us in all of our flaws and imperfections to call down heaven, that you would know us and still use us to bring the divine here to pass on earth. God, would you give us new perspective? Would you give us fresh eyes? Would you give us a renewed commitment? God, help us to stand strong against the distractions or the discouragement, feeling like we're not qualified or not good enough. When we have power, waiting, access, waiting for us, God. Help us to be committed to this life so that people know this is a house of prayer, that we are people of prayer. When our friends and family need us, we have prayer for them. When anxiety is facing our friends or we're wrestling with it ourselves, we have prayer for that. When we're wondering what to do next, life is hard, relationships are crazy, trying to live for you seems impossible sometimes, but we have prayer for that. Help us to endure, to persevere. You are our Father and we are your children. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name.